Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to Bright Talk's Data Governance and Compliance Strategy in the GDPR Era webinar. We still have people uh, logging on to the system, so we'll start in about 60 seconds or so. Just as a uh, background, the webinar is recorded. It, it's on demand, so please feel free to uh, download it or watch it on demand. And then over the course of time, we'll also have uh, some of the panelists uh, upload other documentation or collateral that you can use to your heart's content. Once again, we'll start in about 30 seconds now. Welcome everyone to Bright Talk's panel, Data Governance and Compliance Strategy in the GDPR Era. We have some esteemed panelists today that I'll uh, introduce in the uh, next few minutes. But sort of it's a little bit of a background. We're more or less at uh, GDPR plus 90 days. So there's lessons learned. We, we know what's working. We know what's not working. We know what we have to spend a little bit more time on. We maybe have some things that have been surprising over the last three months. So you'll hear about that today. Uh, you have a chance to uh, ask the panelists questions, so please do so. We'll try to uh, keep this interactive. And for those who just need a really quick refresher, remember GDPR came out of the EU, uh, right to be forgotten, right to understand you know, where your data is being used, how it's being used. Uh, it's of interest to people outside the EU because it really applies you know, not only the citizens while they're in the EU, but companies doing business with the EU as well as EU citizens when they're outside of the EU. There are penalties, of course, involved, and the GDPR takes a very broad definition of personal data. It's not only, you know, your emails, your, your social contacts, but pretty much everything that defines you as a person, not only in your online life, but also how that data relates to your offline life. So our panelists today include Rishi Bhargava, the uh, co-founder of uh, Demisto. Rishi, welcome. Thank you, David. Uh, Joe Carson, uh, Chief Security Scientist of uh, Psychotic. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And then uh, Matt Walmsley, the head of EMEA Marketing for Vectra AI. Welcome, Matt. Good Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So the way we'll run this is that our panelists in advance have put in a couple of uh, talking points that are of interest to them. Uh, we'll let the individual panelists respond first, and then we'll open it to discussion from the group. So I'm actually going to start out with a couple points from uh, Matt at Vectra involving uh, impact of encryption and then the validation of security controls. So Matt, what are your thoughts on this? <coughs> Yeah, well, so so part of the the requirements that GDPR put on us are, you know, if we look at things like Article 25, look at making sure we architect in data protection by default, uh, and it makes it makes some suggestions or about how we have to balance using state-of-the-art capabilities and balancing those across, you know, cost, nature, scope, and context of processing. Now, one of the things we've seen already with uh, enterprises around the world that we we've been working with Vector is, you know, that there's obviously a lot of use of encryption and pseudomization, you know, both at rest and in flight of data. And that's that's brought on some some additional kind of overhead for the people that are accountable for securing that data, so providing that data protection uh, through there. And that's because, you know, once we put encryption in there, that many of the systems and controls that we have become blinded by it. And there's various, you know, technical ways to mitigate some of those, be that the packet, you know, putting man in the middle, be your deep packet inspection based stuff to decrypt on the fly, or to maybe try and, uh, you know, spot, you know, anomalies or areas of concern by the way they're 
behaving as well. So, you know, so the impact of encryption is good, but uh, probably an unintended consequence of that is it makes it a little harder from a security perspective uh, to do that. And, that. and that links very closely to things like Article 32, security of processing, uh, which means, you know, as we process that information, we need to keep it secure. So what we're seeing, you know, particularly larger enterprises trying to do is put in place capabilities that allow them to validate their defenses and, and their control. So you, know, you go through your architectural process to build out the controls. What's my policy is going to be? But then you need a mechanism to validate those and, and also see what's evaded them or circumvented them as well. And that, that's, a, that's an area that's probably increasingly challenging in this world of GDPR. Matt, thanks. Uh, Joseph or uh, Rishi, any uh, commentary on, on that? No, I think uh, there, there is a very interesting theme that I would like to add uh, on Matt's commentary, which is uh, I'm starting to see uh, w one of the biggest things that GDPR does is actually put a little bit more formal structure and clearer requirements on all of these pieces. It's not that the uh, customers and the enterprises are not aware of the encryption and controls, but how the formalized structure is enforced, tracked, audited is the biggest thing that we are starting to see uh, from an impact perspective across. Yeah, absolutely. In addition, in addition, just in addition to that, um, you know, you kind of, the security impact of GDPR really focuses around the adequate security side of it. So, and I think one of the, the biggest things and I think Pat, Matt was, was uh, diving into is that it is a lot of our different pieces of data and not just the actual personal data of, of citizens, but also the data that's associated to that, uh, that identifiable data. And this becomes a very broad perspective. Um, so, you know, things like IP addresses, even the hash of a password is considered personal identifiable information. And then the implications of having that adequate security applied to it um, is major uh, challenges for many organizations. And I think that brings up these two dimensions that, that, you know, that, that we see here. One is the almost doing that data audit, you know, what is the legitimate, you know, the sort of legitimate basis on which you're collecting and pro storing and processing that. But also from an operational perspective, enterprises also need to make sure they've got a, some kind of process to regularly test, assess, and evaluate the effectiveness of those you know, procedures, processes, and, and technical controls that they put in place. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, let's move on to the next one then. And this is uh, for Joseph uh, from Psychotic. Um, the whole you know, spam, and we all, all joke about what's happening in the uh, you know, April, May, June time frame, and then a little bit on uh, clarification of how uh, GDPR relates or doesn't relate to the uh, the Cloud Act. Correct. So there's a couple, of, it was a, always a funny one that uh, a lot of people actually got emails from the Prince in Africa uh, saying, would they like to opt in to continue receiving emails uh, from, from the Prince who's looking to compensate the millions of dollars, uh, which is quite ironic. But uh, one of the things that we did see is that months prior to GDPR coming into effect, was the amount of organizations and companies who left it to the last minute uh, to send multiple emails to many people requesting them to opt in to continue receiving uh, information. What it really identified was that many organizations hadn't really prepared or weren't really uh, structuring their data in the first place, uh, weren't really uh, understanding about where the source of that information was coming from. So a lot of organizations were rushing to the last minute, hoping to make sure that they were able to continue marketing to many of those citizens um, that, that obtained that information, but didn't accordingly make sure that they had good sources of where those individuals had you know, already permitted their use of that information. So hundreds and hundreds of emails were sent to you know, um, almost all of, all of the citizens, and it was you know, not just EU citizens, but potentially people who might be EU citizens in order to get their ability to continue. And many organizations, some got it right, where they were able to you know, continue to get opt-in, because one of the things is it's an opt-in, it's not an opt-out. And many organizations continued to, to, to send, if I don't hear back from you, I'm assuming that it's okay to continue sending information. So yeah. huge amount of spam prior to, to GDPR coming into effect, where many emails and multiple emails uh, were, were sent. And then post, it was a bit quiet uh, for about a month post 
more organizations were afraid, and then some started trying uh, and to see if, if people would react. Uh, but I think you know, the, the, the big challenge and the big issue that we saw post-JPR was that uh, the, the amount of cookies that now you, you had to accept, because before GDPR, that it was, or websites just had to inform you that they use cookies. And then post GDPR, um, then all of a sudden when you go to a website, it started having to be transparent about not just that they're using cookies, but how those cookies have been used. And it was quite shocking the amount of uh, organizations um, that the, the cookies were actually collecting that information and the organizations and third parties that they were sharing it with. To the point actually where it was an interesting statistic that came out just this week saying that actually more than 20% of actually third party sharing of cookies has been dropped in the EU uh, since GDPR has come into effect. I'm then talking about the Cloud Act uh, earlier this year and the update to the, to, uh, the US financial uh, uh, was it, uh, uh, changes that the Cloud Act was added uh, to that. And the Cloud Act was there to solve a major issue that was actually being introduced as part of GDPR with companies like Microsoft and Apple and Amazon who were facing a lot of FBI requests for information uh, for data that they were storing in their data centers in other countries like the EU uh, um, that they were unable to, to comply with um, to meet those uh, requests for information. And the Cloud Act is, is there to try and solve that. But the Cloud Act itself allows uh, the U.S. government under you know, certain uh, legal and prosecution uh, areas to actually request directly from the country uh, rather than actually going to the technology companies. They can actually now go directly to Ireland and request uh, the information or the data relating to a specific client to be transferred. So now the onus is on country to country relationship rather than putting pressure on uh, companies and technology vendors that store data outside of those, uh, the US. Rishi, uh, Matt, any, any thoughts on that? So I'm based in the UK, as you can hear from my accent. And we in the UK, this this you know this broader topic of lawful basis of processing and consent is a big part of that. Uh, that that's driven a, a kind of a double in data access requests since GDPR came through. And so, so one of the things we can take from that as organisations that have to be GDPR compliant is we must be ready to be able to process those requests for you know, what data have you got on me, where did you get it, what is your lawful basis of processing it. And we've heard about you know, consent and the impact on cookies. You know, GDPR is definitely the cookie monster. But organizations need to, you know, can rely on other mechanisms to, to, to capture, hold, and process information. But they've got to make sure they've made uh, you know, appropriate decisions and documented it. And that could be you know, contract, legal obligation, public interest, or legitimate interest as well. So, but certainly, you know, for anyone who's very data centric, uh, it, it's put a, a lot more onus on it. And I absolutely recognize this kind of cookie, uh, kind of opt-in fatigue almost that happened as, a, as we ran up to, uh, to May the 28th and GDPR going live. Okay, thank you. Later on, uh, we're going to address the uh, question on uh, fines and you know, possible, you know, existing lawsuits going on. So that should be an interesting part of the discussion. So, uh, Rishi, um, over to you on, you know, the role of incidents uh, response plans and, you know, what are, what's happening now in terms of the, the, the impact on, you know, your whole business processes and, and the costs, and are they uh, greater than before? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the interesting aspects if you look at it, and I think this is very specific, uh, one of the pieces that there is like, hey, any breach of data should be notified within 72 hours. The, the big uh, uh, piece here is if you look at organizations, uh, most of the enterprises did have some sort of an incident response plan in place, even prior to GDP. But what was not clear is how severe the fines or the impacts would be if there was no incident response plan. So there's, there's multiple aspects of this that uh, we are noticing. Uh, one of the aspects is, since there is a very, very formal requirement to say, hey, you must have an incident response plan, anything uh, or any breach of any sort should be uh, exposed in 72 hours, which is a very hard timeline. Imagine an organization found something, and they need to, as soon as they found, they need to figure out the root cause, they need to figure out what is the level of exposure, notify people, 
So this time limit poses uh, a lot of um, restrictions on the organization, which means we need to put in more resources to actually do the rapid declaration. And uh, not only the time is the challenge here, there needs to be very, very formal communication plans prior to the breach, right? So figuring out how will you notify, who will you notify, uh, what will be the methods of notification, what will be uh, containment uh, procedures, all of that needs to be figured out. Now, the good news here is even though it looks on the surface it's creating more work for the organizations ahead of time. It's creating more cost if such a thing happens. But each of these steps put in place once and doing a periodic review is a very, very uh, strong way to keep a very strong security posture because there is, I think we have always heard this phrase, which is it's a matter of when, not if, that there will be some kind of a breach of some level. And I think what putting together a formal incident response plan does is helping you get prepared for it, having proper procedures within the organization, and then being able to uh, do a periodic review. Uh, so I think that's one of the pieces which we are seeing, and clearly the impact and costs are higher now because of the, the scrutiny that's put in because of the time restrictions that have been put in. So both of those things, uh, kind of putting in more structure, putting in um, a more limelight on the incident response plan. Thanks, Rishi. Uh, Matt or Joe, uh, any uh, commentary to that or any additional perspective? Sure. I think I, I completely agree. Uh, I was involved in GDPR for, for the 10 years up until uh, it actually became the effect. And uh, over that, incident response was a major discussion. Um, and there was many revisions in the incident response portion. So the 72 hours is really there to notify the data protection authority. Um, so that was more the law, the, the legal and law uh, uh, enforcement within those countries related to data protection. And it's also then used to be it was 14 days um, that you had to notify the impacted party. And of course, over many debates and many revisions, that was changed to, to um, within uh, adequate uh, time frame. Because what they realized was that actually each breach is not equal. Each incident uh, is not the same. So one incident that has email uh, being leaked versus one incident that has financial details, both cannot be treated equally uh, in regards to the response. So therefore, they realized that uh, without undue delay meant that uh, it depended on the classification of severity of the actual incident itself. And to Rishi's point, I think that this is where organizations can invest um, a, a, as part of GDPR and actually help their organizations as a result. Uh, because being able to respond to an incident effectively and timely uh, significantly reduces the, any potential cost of an incident. And this is something organizations should look to, um, to really, as part of uh, uh, their security strategy and investment that also aligns with the uh, requirements and compliance of the GDPR regulation. Yeah, this is a piece of legislation which does, you know, it does put more onus on the enterprise, and there's a cost associated with that, but the payback is, by significantly improving your security posture, you, you reduce your organizational risk, don't you? So that's the that's what we need to aim for is using this as a catalyst to drive, you know, improved security hygiene and, and reduce our risk. Absolutely. Okay, so the next one uh, I'll throw out to the uh, the three of you. And it's really a, a gut check. Do you, you feel that uh, organizations are, are geared up for, for GDPR? And then just as important, almost more importantly, I mean, there are a lot of moving parts. And, you know, do organizations have the, uh, the, the people, the processes, and the technical controls in place to actually do this? Uh, do they need to uh, bring to the table a number of external vendors? Uh, can they act as SIs? Are there single vendors that, that can do this? Is it, is it overly complex for a mid-sized organization? So let me start with... Uh, Matt and then Joseph and then Rishi, uh, one by one. So, Matt, what, what's your thought on this? So, so the trite answer is yes and no. Are most organizations impacted and geared up? They're all impacted because the legislation affects any organization processing data from any, somebody in the EU that there is a whole spectrum of, uh, of readiness here and, uh, and a whole spectrum of attitude. You know, whilst we've heard about you know, the, the, you know, the, the headline punitive fines and stuff, some people are taking a wait and see approach. 
Why? Uh, we don't advocate that, but you know, this is a piece of legislation, and until it's tested in law, you know, people won't know, you know, to, to how aggressive or to, uh, how, how severe it, it's going to be applied. So, you know, I, I wouldn't say most organisations are geared up or are ready for this yet. Uh, and certainly, there's no silver bullets. And anyone who says, you know, there's a single single way of doing this is is materially wrong. You know, it, it's absolutely contextual. And I do think most enterprises do have to, you know, integrate a number of, you know, technology stacks and processes, you know, which may be automated using, you know, tools. Uh, uh, and more importantly, embed security across the organisation. You know, this isn't a problem that. Uh, you know, the, the IT or the, or the information security team have to own, it has to be across the whole organization. Uh, Joseph? Sure, I mean, I completely agree. One, one of the things that I think that many organizations um, that looking at GDPR, one of the first things that they had to do was, first of all, understand, you know, and do an assessment, does it apply to them? Um, is there anything that they significantly need to do? Are they part of critical infrastructure or are they part of basically mass you know, processing and collection of citizens' data. So one of the major things that many organizations had to do was first of all identify uh, does it impact them and what type of data are they collecting because also the sensitivity of data. Uh, are you just collecting contact information versus financial or versus even criminal backgrounds? If you're, if you're a, um, like a, a company that's doing, for example, recruitment, then what information do you have on those people sharing data with you? Um, into financial or criminal backgrounds can be sensitive and then means that, that the actual uh, security that they need to apply, uh, the importance that they need to, to become is, is, is very high. So many organizations, the first thing was doing a data impact assessment, really understanding, and it was actually a good thing because organizations needed to understand, well, what, am I, what data do I have? Because many were just collecting everything with the you know, potential that they might need to use it in the future. Now it really got organizations to think about, well, what do I really have? and what security is being applied to it, and what's the association, and does then GDPR apply to, to them? And do they have the appropriate consent uh, recorded? Do they have contracts in place? Which is, of course, why we saw that span, you know, span month in May, uh, because organizations were not collecting appropriate uh, consent from those that were getting the information from. So absolutely, I think many organizations have started it, but no way uh, are the majority of organizations fully prepared. They've probably done enough to get by today. They've done some of the basic checks uh, to understand the data and the applicability to them, but no way have organizations done the appropriate implementation or, or fully process to be fully compliant with GDPR. And it will only be when we see within a year, maybe two, when we start seeing the massive fines getting uh, applied, will then organizations take a very serious approach to it. Thanks. And Rishi? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think uh, very little to add uh, on uh, Matt and Joseph's comments, but one of the parallels I will draw is we have all seen the PCI unfold similarly, right? So I think the bigger question that I would uh, want our audience to think about, it, it's not about whether they're prepared today, uh, whether uh, they're geared up for the GDPR today or not, but uh, this is going to be an ongoing journey, right? And this basically means it's, it's not a one in time evaluation of how the data is used and how it's stored and who it affects and all of those pieces. But it's like every time you add a capability to your marketing organization, or if you start to collect more data from your customers, or if you add a product feature, how does GDPR and the controls there affect on an ongoing basis? And this, I think, was the biggest learning from a PCI perspective, right? When PCI was enforced, everybody was like, okay, we need to turn around now and checklist all these requirements. And then PCI, next version came around, and the next version came around. And now if you think about it, how companies approach is for every feature that says, hey, does this, is this in PCI scope or not? And if it is in scope, here are the controls. So the, the way to think about it is, of course, do this once in time evaluation, but also start to plan on what's going to happen on an ongoing basis as you roll out new capabilities in your organizations which require data or which collect data. And that's, I think, uh, a big uh, piece which is going to affect how the lives of our customers and lives of enterprise uh, change overall. Uh, absolutely. But I think that, but I, but I think there's some, you know, there's, 
there is ambiguity in GDPR given that it's a piece of legislation, not a compliance framework. Like if we look at PCI DSS, it's relatively, you know, comparatively prescriptive. You know where you need to go and what you need to look at. GDPR is ready to, you know, to, to last a long time. So I think you know, there's a question here we can, you know, the, the, the panel members can see from the audience about what are the barriers to adoption uh, through here. And hmm. I think there are, you know, the, the, the people processing you know, and, and technology, the people part, Probably the most important here, from you know the people being your your first line of defence, so good security hygiene and behaviour, but perhaps more importantly for CISOs and data protection officers is, you know, how do the board, how do the executive body of your organisation view cyber security? You know, you need to educate them and move maybe those the laggards in their thinking beyond this is a, a problem of technology. It it it's really one that needs to be across the organisation. Absolutely. And I think one, one, an additional part there, which is interesting, I got to participate in the uh, EU presidency that was in, held in Estonia the uh, last six months of last year, uh, which uh, meant that you know, all of the uh, European Court of Justice and Supreme Court got to hold meetings. And there was an interesting discussion that if you look through GDPR, there is no mention of data owner. Um, it's only the data subject. So irrespective of ownership, <laughs> uh, or who generated the data, um, or who created the data, um, it's only about the, the subject of the data, not uh, whether it is owned or not by a specific company or person. So I'll, re I'll re read the question again uh, that came in for the benefit of everyone, and then uh, we can get some more perspective on it. The question from the audience was, what internal, cultural, individual, fear, et cetera, roadblocks are slowing or stopping adoption of best practices, creation, and implementation of process and procedures? Sound data and operational governance are fundamental. They are the linchpin. Why is there so much ignorance or resistance? So, any other perspective on that? Um, I can give a comment uh, from you know my my kind of view on that. I, I agree that the challenge for many is that you know, when we're talking about uh, enterprises or businesses, uh, that they have to you know was it uh, operate and they have to 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 you know make money and, and finance themselves. So at the same time, when we're adopting these types of regulations, best practices, and you know, regulations and, and, and compliances, um, there has to be a balance for those organizations to make sure that they're able to continue operational-wise. So what we do find is that uh, many will, will look at this from a risk-based approach uh, into what is an enough re risk reduction in order to continue and meet the compliances. And this is what we really looked at. So sometimes it, it may be seen as ignorance or resistance, um, but it's it's a balance between risk and uh, and security, and and that needs to be uh, yeah. I've, I've seen, and let me give you an, an anecdote from a, one of the largest uh, online retailers in the UK that's gone through a massive digital transformation. They, they've moved from security being the uh, you know the, the security guards and the people that say no, you can't do that. It's not compliant. To to working with the lines of business very early in development cycles mm -hmm. to kind of engineer in security by design and this is a good example of working practice that builds up a culture where everyone feels some ownership and accountability for security across the organization i think that's as we move to this digital world where we're increasingly living in that's really really fundamental because you know to, to the point made these organizations have to you know have to work have to create value and we can't just be throwing roadblocks in there we need to show how security can be an enabler for, for new business and value creation Okay, thanks. We go on to the uh, the next set of talking points, and we'll continue with you. Um, you know, talk about uh, data impact assessments, and then what are some of the things in place for breach detection and notification? Okay, so GDPR's data uh, data protection impact assessments, Article 35, really make sure you know make you accountable for making sure that prior to processing uh, any data. You've done an assessment on that data, so we talked about what's our legitimate right to have that, what's its source, and make sure that the processing of those operations still protects it. So this idea of monitoring all your, you know, being able to monitor all your communications and, and spot if, uh, if there's some vulnerabilities or, or you know, security impacts there. Yeah, and, and we've done this with organizations. Uh, using, you know, we're an AI company that used uh, AI to automate the detection of uh, advanced attackers inside the organization. But aside from that, we invariably find you know, poor examples of poor data handling. You know, and this could be you know, sort of sloppily 
you know, misconfigured uh, systems as they talk to each other, particularly with federated applications or, or poor security hygiene. So this this comes back to a point that one of the other panel members said: it's it's a never-ending you know, project. It's, you know, security by its very nature is an iterative process. We, you know, we we learn, we change, we implement, we monitor, and, and we keep running around through that cycle. Yeah, I think IBM said a generation ago, security is a, uh, a journey and not a destination. So probably a bunch of other people said that. Uh, Joseph or uh, Rajiv, any, any commentary on that? I think this is um, no, going to the, yeah. br the breach detection side um, and notification. This becomes one of the most important things is that companies can no longer ignore uh, uh, you know, uh, incidents. Uh, or hide them. It means is that they have to have more trans transparency and more accountability. So this becomes, a, 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 there has been a, a bit of a twofold part of this, however, is if you look at some of the recent incidents post GDPR that were disclosed, I think the organizations uh, disclosed them publicly, probably hastily, because while the incident in digital forensics was still ongoing, they didn't know the full extent of the breaches, so therefore, you'll find, you know, they release a, a disclosure and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger the more they investigate. Um, so this is some of the kind of the learning curves that we're finding from this breach detection portion is that it's never truly fully clear until the digital forensics is being complete. So this notification and, and response um, and investigation, they had to kind of be held and people and organizations had to get better at the PR and public disclosure part of this uh, because it, it is an area that's... Uh, very poor at this stage. And I think that's really interesting. About how, how does an organization make that decision to say, right, we're at a point where we, we, we feel compelled to make you know, a notification to our supervisory authority, so in the mm -hmm. UK, the Information Commissioner's Office, and, and to the affected parties? Because, you know, it takes, a, you know, quite often it takes a long time for a breach to surface, right? Uh, on mm -hmm. average, you know, an advanced attacker will probably be live within the organization for, for almost 100 days. So how, mm -hmm. how do you find them? And if we can find them early, perhaps we can find them before there's an actual breach, and so not a notifiable, notifiable event. So this is where context and understanding of exactly what's going on is really, really important. Yeah, and coming back to Richard's comment about incident response plan, you know, that, that forensics and you know, making sure you know exactly who's affected, uh, what's happened, why it happened, you know, those are very, very important data points to have to help you make an informed decision of do I need to, to notify you or is this just a, you know, a lower grade security incident that can be handled in house. And I think we have to accept that, you know, by nature, we, we don't necessarily want to put our hands up and kind of fess up that we've had a problem unless we really have to or unless our customers have, have been impacted. Mm -hmm. okay, thanks. Yeah. Let me uh, I think the only... Then. The interesting thing, it's, it's again, planning, 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 right, guys? I think, uh, to me, uh, it boils down, and I keep, keep telling customers, just plan ahead, and you'll be better off. Plan ahead, and you'll be better off. And that applies to all of the breach, notification, and detection things. To your comment, I think it was um, um, uh, somebody commenting about uh, how do they make a decision of when to notify and what to notify. I think it's interesting, outside of GDPR, there have been a lot of good guidelines around uh, what needs to be notified, what is the thresholds, uh, and we need to just go dig up those security guidelines and then apply it throughout the organization, because yeah, GDPR is not very prescriptive about the thresholds there, per se. Okay, uh, Joseph, this one's for you now, and last, uh, you know, what, 10, 15 minutes ago, we were talking about fines and you know what, what what's happening out there in the world. So, what's happening with the lawsuits? Um, we also hear examples of companies that you know their whole social or uh, data you know model is based on something that doesn't fly in in uh, the EU anymore, and they close up shop. And then uh, going back to the discussion we just had about you know detection notification, uh, is it harder now with uh, GDPR? What, what are your thoughts there? Sure, absolutely. So, so starting starting off with the lawsuits, right after you know, on uh, literally the day after May 26th, when uh, GDPR was in effect, uh, Max Schrems, who, who's famously a, known as an Austrian data privacy activist, so Max Schrems was the person who had uh, uh, sued uh, Microsoft and Facebook 
uh, several years ago um, when it was related to the uh, safe harbor. And remember, safe harbor was the framework that was there between the EU and US in order to do data sharing. And of course, following Snowden's rele revelations about the data collection um, and the correlation and use of that data, um, Max Schrems did a lawsuit which ultimately ended safe harbor and made it invalidated. And then it was then replaced with the EU data, uh, EU US privacy shield, which is currently the framework to, uh, which is being used to share data between the EU and the US to date. So right after GDPR, um, of course, uh, Max Schrems uh, filed uh, a lawsuit with the collective uh, against both Google and Facebook, uh, which is you know, worth about 8.8 .8 billion US dollars on the first day. So this is significant. And what didn't, definitely did not help uh, Facebook was the Cambridge Analytica uh, saga that happened just the month before related to the uh, uh, US elections. And this is something that, of course, when uh, uh, Zuckerberg did his uh, was it uh, Congress, uh, his notes were leaked, showing that doing some on GDPR, but not a lot, <laughs> uh, didn't really help their case. Uh, so, so right now, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how this uh, uh, plays out. Um, and the second part, even Google um, had some uh, major revelations recently, that even if you turned off the uh, location uh, in Android, it still collected it. Uh, so there's a lot of challenges right now in regards to both Facebook and Google in regards to where this lawsuit will go um, and the implications that could potentially happen. So uh, in the, in these both companies are built on data. Um, this is you know, two of the major companies who are collecting personal information and they're making money on it. Um, will be an indication to what will happen with other companies who are having the same model. Some companies, of course, did decide that they couldn't fundamentally change their their platforms or their solutions. Um, so they decided to actually close up. Uh, if you're coming from an IP address from the EU and you're going to those sites uh, to get, obtain those services, you cannot obtain the services. Um, they will actually, there's some have uh, put up like service fees uh, so that they're not advertising to you. You can pay for a subscription. So a lot of media companies who had just purely news sites that were generating uh, from advertising decided that they just couldn't comply. So therefore, and they're, uh, audience was not big enough in the EU to, to determine uh, continuing to serve those, uh, those citizens. Uh, many online gaming companies, uh, their platforms that, you know, for online gaming, um, was it uh, found that they were just unable to change the platform enough in order to comply with GDPR. So some companies decided that uh, they decided to, to not provide service. Of course, there's ways around it by doing things like VPN or changing your IP address. Um, but ultimately, um, those companies decided not to serve and continue providing services to the EU. And on the side effect, on the result of this as well, on the other side, is it also made some of the actual investigations much more difficult. One of the tools that we would have used uh, uh, prior to GDPR coming into effect, which was basically who is. Uh, so when you were being attacked or you had, uh, you know, mimicking domains that were registered or you were receiving emails, uh, from phishing campaigns, some of the ways to be able to investigate and quickly shut down those domains was using the you know the domain name uh, system, which is from ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Signed Names and Numbers. Basically, GDPR meant that the who is function or capability was no longer possible. So it means that and we, there was a bit of a kind of you know uh, discussion going on in the security community whether this GDPR is a bad thing as a result of that. Uh, in my mind, I always say that yes. There is the positives and negatives. Um, this is a negative part of it, but I'm pretty sure that we can find ways to overcome this. Uh, we should not you know, go back because if something doesn't work, we need to find solutions and move forward. So this is a, an issue that is still a problem today, being able to identify um, who's attacking companies. Um, so it's something that we will have to, to find uh, innovative solutions going forward. That's a that's a barrier yeah, we've built. Uh, yeah, I, I'll jump right on that. So this is uh, particularly the uh, the building and use of malicious domains. Uh, you're right. Who is has just taken a really useful piece of data set off the field for the good guys. Uh, one way around it, and it's not a complete panacea by any means, is to look at as opposed to who registered the domain, but actually look at how that domain is behaving. What, you know, what am I seeing it doing? It am I seeing 
you know, suspicious command and control from bad actors coming across through that. Am I using it and stuff like that? But but Joseph, I've got an interesting question for you, and is it, maybe it's a little controversial. But mm. do we do organisations even care about catching the cyber criminals? Because attribution and the ability of law enforcement to take them down, I, I, you know, in many cases they, they'll you know look at people that pay ransomware. They just want to fix the problem as quickly as possible and move back on to their day to day business. So Absolutely. I wonder how. Uh, how how important it is for us, you know, at the end, end enterprise. For some of the larger organizations, um, they prefer to uh, remove responsibility, accountability from themselves to make it, you know, point it to a nation state or country. So they want to use some of those attribution. Um, but we all know attribution is one of the most difficult things in cybercrime um, because people are able to mask, hide on, in countries where there's no uh, legal implications. So um, I think that many, many organizations are now taking this away. It's actually removing their ability to point the finger um, and remove accountability. So, yes, it does make law enforcement and security researchers' job more difficult, but I think it, uh, companies who are victims, that uh, th their responsibility and, and focus should be returning back to operational status and, and function um, and let law enforcement deal with attribution. Okay, let me go on to uh, Raji then, Rashi. Um, and then uh, some of your, your talking points, is, is it hard to uh, prepare for a breach? What are the things to keep in mind? And then finally, is, is it only affecting companies in Europe? The first question is, is very much related to the last you know, few minutes of discussion. So what, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, so I think um, the, the, the first question, how hard is it to prepare for a breach, right? And I think, uh, um, uh, I would say kind of take uh, baby steps, right? I mean, uh, typically uh, preparing for a breach or preparing an incident response plan, whatever you would like to put it as a series of steps, which needs uh, a lot of introspection of the organization processes, the kind of data organization collects and hosts. Uh, but I think it's a journey. As I said, like figure out what are your key exposure points, uh, what kind of security posture is in place, uh, what kind of processes do you have for response, what do you have for um, containment, and then prepare what I call a maturity model over time. So I think the, the best way to do it is think of it as an assessment in time, uh, start to prepare a maturity model saying, hey, this is the first step, this is how we'll prepare, this is what we will do, uh, and go from there. Is it hard? I think it is definitely very, very hard, and I think it becomes even harder because the opposing force for most organizations is the attack surface or the exposure surface continues to grow. Your product teams will continue to build new products, release new products, and the security teams need to now keep catching up to prepare a breach response plan. So I think uh, as the speed of innovation and the products that get out and the kind of data that's collected about the, uh, about the customers is increases, preparing a breach response plan becomes harder. And this is why I think think of it as a living document uh, rather than a point in time uh, document. Uh, is it only affecting companies in Europe? And I think this is, as, as you said, it is related. And this is a very interesting thing is like, Pretty much all organizations are very global in nature. Can you say that any company only sells in Europe or has customer data only from Europe and not in U.S.? Or any organization which is based in U.S. not have customers from Europe? And it's not true, right? So in some way, the way the world has changed and how everything is so global now, every organization touches customers in Europe whether they are based in U.S., based in Asia, based in Europe or some other part of the world, uh, you cannot say, hey, my website is not accessible to anybody in Europe, and hence I don't want to be GDPR compliant. If somebody from Europe searches for something, ends up on your website, now you are hosting the data from a U European citizen, and hence you need to, in some form, factor, need to be compliant. Now, you don't need to be compliant with all the aspects unless you hold significant data. But my point, again, is in the global world and how we are connected, the data privacy, not specifically JDPR, every organization in the world needs to think about it and start to prepare if they're not prepared. And there's already signs of similar regulations being talked about 
in India and other Asian countries. So think of it as getting yourself prepared for the data privacy laws rather than GDPR specific, even if it does not affect. So that's at least my thoughts. I uh, would love to hear other panelists' thoughts on this specific topic. Uh, absolutely. I, I was told, yeah, I was told a metaphor. When, when I first got involved uh, with the European Commission um, discussing GDPR, and I was originally, to be honest, my personal opinions were originally against it, and then I, over time I became more of a, a promoter of GDPR. And the metaphor is going to, to reach is your, your point is that when I was told about GDPR, to think of it as a, a ship containing, you know, uh, those containers on the ship are, are basically information and data. And as it's flowing through cyberspace um, of the oceans, that simply what GDPR is saying that no longer can we actually just control the data within our borders, but we have to make sure whatever that vessel is in cyberspace, that the flag in the vessel is really putting the flag up saying GDPR applies to the laws and regulations of GDPR applies to this data. Um, simply so an international border is the same concept uh, because we're coming, as you're saying, a much more no borderless uh, world in regards to digital. We may have physical borders and we may have physical processes uh, to try and define boundaries, but you're absolutely correct. Uh, GDPR, and when we get into digital space, literally it is borderless. Internet is interconnected all over the place. Data flows freely and it means that we have to be more attentive to the data and not the actual connectivity itself. I'd like to humanize that because, you know, that data belongs to people or represents people. And it's ultimately their relationship with these organizations, with their brand, you know, and their, their level of trust that's impacted when we have breaches or we, or we don't take good care of their data. So, you know, there is the possibility and we should be looking for the opportunities to link good data governance back into the organization's, you know, way of demonstrating that they're, they're good custodians of their customers and their stakeholders' data. And if they do that, even if they have a breach, but they act responsibly and quickly and accurately, they have the chance to maintain and even build those relationships. So, you know, we, we need to move away from seeing security as just a, a cost or a piece of technical regulation that we need to do. It's ultimately safety. <laughs> Thank you. So let me go on to the last two uh, talking points, and we also have another uh, question that, that came in for the audience. Once again, if you have questions, please type them in to your portal. Uh, this is uh, less Rishi than, than Joseph and Matt. We're 90 days in. You know, what have we learned? One, two, or three bullets. And then as part of that, what's been simpler and, and what's been more difficult? So Rishi, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think what we have learned is it's not going away. Uh, you won't believe how many customers, and it's not a joke. Uh, I, when, when this whole first thing came about about a year and a half ago, the whole serious conversation, a lot of the prospects and customers and uh, my contacts they said, hey, I, I don't think it's going to go into effect. Don't worry. Something will come up. It's, it's, it's going to change. And it is not, right? And I think so that is one of the things which we have learned is it's, it's here to stay. And I think uh, we've already discussed a lot. It's here to stay for a good reason because we do need these controls. Uh, it, it's in fact, I think to me, uh, the other way I think about it is if the organizations put these controls in, they're reducing their own liability for getting uh, uh, getting sued or doing something wrong and then getting into trouble later on. Uh, what I think has been simpler, believe it or not, I think uh, initially my reaction was, oh my God, uh, just getting uh, understanding the details here will be super difficult, but I think what I'm seeing is there's enough, uh, well, it's not full understanding, but there's good level of understanding of what this means. What has been very difficult is now translating that understanding onto how it applies to your organization and being able to really implement in depth. So that's that's my thoughts, but I think it's here to stay. Let's embrace it and figure out a plan is what I would leave the audience with. Thanks, Rishi. Joseph? Uh, absolutely. And I think, uh, Rishi, just to extend on that, uh, it, it's here to stay, and it won't be the last one. We're starting to see many other uh, uh, countries, and also, you know, even the U.S., we had the Californian uh, Privacy Act. We have the New York one that's being investigated. There's UK is now considering in a post-Brexit scenario their um, ability for, for a GDPR equivalent. 
So it's definitely not the last we're going to see, and there's going to be more uh, revisions and more countries introducing this as, as we move forward. So that's something that we need to be prepared for. Um, so this is a good baseline to, to start, but it's not the end. Um, and I think, yes, what my experience in, in, in being participating in this is that what has been easier is I was surprised actually at the data uh, impact assessments that I participated in, that they were, were actually we were afraid at the beginning, but once we started conducting it, it got much easier and much more fluid and it became simpler once we started uh, understanding more about the applications and services that we had and, and you know, ensuring that we had more visibility over things like shadow IT. Um, so data impact assessment was much easier than, than, than expected. However, what was much more difficult was the supply chain, um, was the third party vendors that you do business with, was how uh, confidence and how much you uh, knew about their GDPR implementations. So that was much more difficult. Uh, part of it was actually dealing with your uh, vendors that you uh, uh, get services from and understanding their uh, uh, compliance with GDPR. That was a bit of a challenge uh, and still continues to be. Yeah, I think yeah, Jennifer, that, yeah, yeah. supply chain is a, is a big attack surface for organizations. We've seen a number over the last year, plenty of attacks from there. We're definitely at the, uh, with the not to Winston Churchill, we're at the end of the beginning and we absolutely should expect to see, you know, some uh, similar type legislation or, or requirements, you know, in different organizations. I think we still don't, you know, we, we, you asked the question, David, what have we learned? What we don't know is the degree to which the supervisory authorities will come after us. You know, we've heard the headline fines, but maybe they're for the really, really large global organizations that have been truly negligent or dismissive of the legislation. So that, that's, that's, I think, you know, we should be watching with interest to see how that plays out. Okay, thank you. We have another question that came in from the audience. I'll read it for clarification. Uh, do you think the SAs, such as ICO, that the uh, Information Commissioner in the UK, will come down on small medium enterprises in the UK, that could be elsewhere, to make the point that they're subject to the regulation too? I definitely get the sense that the small medium sized businesses feel that the cost doesn't justify the means and therefore they'll be okay. Thoughts? Matt, uh, you're probably well versed uh, to answer that. Yeah, so look, you, your response to GDPR needs to be contextual and proportionate to your organization and the data you process. You know, I saw a survey, and I, and I can't remember the number, so forgive me, that, that asked, asked all the European supervisory authorities, you know, to what degree are you resourced to implement and you know, police GDPR? And, and most of them came back and said, we're resourced to respond to breach notifications, but we shouldn't think that these supervisory authorities are all sat there like the cyber police knocking on your door and going to check you're compliant. So the onus is on you to demonstrate you've taken reasonable and proportional steps. Now, you know, in my private life, I help a really small non-for-profit organization and they've had to go through GDPR, but the responses and steps they've taken have been completely different to the ones we've done here at Vector as a commercial organization. So, you know, take advice. Uh, the, the, the ICO website is, uh, is, is a very good source if you're based in the UK to take you through that. And, and maybe, you know, to, you know, buying some services and help, you know, you don't have to dedicate a data protection officer if you're a small or medium business. You can even outsource that and, you know, have it on a half day basis once, once every couple of weeks just to, you know, to demonstrate that you've thought about it, you've taken reasonable steps, make sure you've documented that, and, uh, you know, you put appropriate technical controls in place. And that might be as simple as popping on two-factor authentication and you know, some, some next-gen firewalls you know, compared to a very large organization which have a much richer and more formal you know, tech stack processes, incident response capabilities that, that you've heard us talk about today. Thanks. Uh, Joseph Barishi? Sure. So you know, I agree uh, with, with uh, Matt Skinney, but here, it, it, when we look at it, it's contextual in regards to the type of business. So it's going back to you know one of the things you mentioned earlier. You really need to understand the data that you're collecting and processing. And if you're a small business and you're just you know uh, collecting nominal about your, your own customers, then you'll just have to do you know the basic needs to make sure you're you're doing adequate security and applying the right things and doing you know the right distribution. Um, but if you're a small company and you're doing, you know, big data scoring um, on mass amount of data, then that's different. So it really comes down to the contextual part of the business. 
there, just like Matt, there was one nonprofit that I worked with, which was basically um, a child abuse agency. That one of the challenges with GDPR was that you needed parental consent. And one of the other things was that, of course, that they're receiving calls from children and recording those calls, then GDPR meant that they had to have consent from the parent. So there was a challenge. Uh, it was one of the only few that there was an exception, uh, and that was only the exception for that small nonprofit organization was only around consent of parents. They didn't get full consent. They still had to do the rest uh, of the general data protection, uh, but they did get an exception on the consent uh, for, for uh, children. So it really comes down to really understanding that the line of business and, and the, the type of business you're in and the type of data that you're collecting. Okay, thank you. So uh, we spoke a little bit when we introduced the CPA uh, just in my backyard here in uh, Santa Clara, California. A lot of people are drawing, you know, parallels between uh, CCPA and, and GDPR. Uh, just as a note, we've, we've got a, a webinar on this uh, tomorrow, the CISO's perspective. Um, one of the, the things that I'll, I'll leave you with is that uh, this is going to be the next battleground because CCPA took a, um, a very, uh, you know, almost like a strict uh, hand towards uh, personal privacy out in California, uh, calling it like a mini GDPR in ways. Um, the major social companies uh, aren't okay with that, and they are now going to lobby Washington to try to put something in place at the national level that is less restrictive, less onerous um, than CCPA with the hope that what, ha what comes out of Washington will override and invalidate the, uh, the California regulations. So it's going to be a very interesting um, six or 12 months. And with that, um, let me ask for any, uh, we've got a couple minutes left, any last uh, comments? Uh, we'll start with uh, you, Matt. Just, I think there's, you know, as, as you move to this post-GDPR uh, post implementation phase, look for opportunities to, you know, automate uh, where you can because you don't want to get tied down into a lot of additional overlay processes that cost time and money. And in doing so, you, you, you shortcut the time it takes to, you know, to find those things that invariably will get in uh, and respond to them. So, you know, look for opportunities to reduce costs and improve agility through, through automation. Thanks, man, and good perspective today. Let's go to uh, Joseph now. Uh, absolutely. I think uh, some of my final thoughts and in, in, in closing comments is that uh, this is really an opportunity for many organizations to, to reset their security um, you know, that they apply and their strategies. So use this as an opportunity to ensure that you get the right investment in order to make sure that you're doing the right adequate security for the data that you're collecting and processing for years to come. Uh, so this is an opportunity in order to set basically the baseline and use it to make sure that uh, it's uh, putting the right for strategy and right perspective into making, as Matt said, more automation, more efficiency, in order to basically protect the data that uh, citizens have entrusted you with. Thank you, Joseph. And Rishi? I think uh, it's hard to go third on these, uh, but I think I'll reiterate the fact and uh, kind of leave it, which is says plan ahead and optimize, because uh, as we already talked, it's here to stay and there's more to come. So planning ahead and uh, picking uh, the right set of tools to optimize across, whether it's automation, whether it's uh, collaboration and other pieces will help you a lot. Okay, thank you, Rishi. So thanks again for uh, you know dialing in, tuning into us uh, today. Once again, the, um, the panel will be uh, posted in the next hour on Bright Talk. Please uh, you know review it on demand. Uh, I'd ask the uh, presenters for their uh, email addresses, but I'm not allowed to under GDPR. Just kidding. So uh, once again, um, Matt, uh, Joseph, and Rishi, thanks again, and uh, have a great remainder of your day wherever you are. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye.